Thank you guys for joining us today for the tax provision of the new CARES Act webinar. We are excited to be talking through um, really the detail around this and we're excited to have uh, Jeff Levine, the lead financial director of advanced planning at Buckingham with us. Uh, Shai Akabas, the director of economic policy project at the Bipartisan Policy Center and Jamie Hopkins, the director of retirement planning for Carson. Thank you guys so much for being here and I'm interested in hearing about the CARES Act from you guys and what you think is really going to help people, um, what the most impactful piece is. So Shai, you're the policy guy, let's hear from you first. So there's several different pieces. I mean, when you have a $2 trillion piece of legislation, it's gonna have lots of things in it for lots of people. Um, I think the biggest impact for the economy is likely to be the pieces that focus on trying to keep people employed. So specifically, the support for small businesses and helping them try to keep people on payroll, and then the unemployment insurance benefit bump up for people who unfortunately lose their jobs or have their hours dramatically cut as a result of uh, the coronavirus economic fallout. And I think we're talking about millions and millions of people in both of these cases. There are already people who are saying that the money that was allocated in the legislation, about $350 billion to small businesses, is not going to be enough for the support that they are intending to provide. And so they might have to come back later to supplement that. And the unemployment insurance, we already can see that it's going to be incredibly important because just in the unemployment insurance claims last week, we saw about 3.3 million people, which was ma orders of magnitude more than we had ever seen before file. And I, we expect to see a, I don't know about similar, but a very elevated number this week as well. And I think that's going to continue as the crisis goes on. Yeah, Jeff, for you, what, what's the most common question you're getting of, on the planning side for how people should be prepared for the CARES Act? Well, uh, there's, it's a lot in the bill. So I think it really depends on individuals' personal circumstances. So certainly, I think probably the number one question is still, am I getting a check? And if so, how much is it? And, and where am I going to get it? You know, people like free, quote unquote, money, even though it's kind of their own money back. It's, uh, you know, people like getting checks. Uh, so that's probably the most common question, but we also are seeing a lot of questions from retirees who simply wanting to know about the waiver of required minimum distributions, et cetera, just who are in a completely different phase of life, right? Someone who is now out of work and, and struggling is really concerned about that paycheck coming through um, and how the unemployment system will work and what are the enhancements there, whereas a retirement saver who is living off their retirement savings um, and has seen, let's say, a retirement account decimated may be much more interested in the relief on the requirement of distributions or other provisions like that. Jamie, what are you uh, most answering questions about around the CARES Act these days? Yeah, well, I think, I think Jeff hit a lot of them. I, and also Shai hit this one too. But I'd probably say from ours, we've gotten a lot on the small business side. And small business, not even feeling small, right? I mean, we're talking 500 employees at a location. I mean, that's not small. Um, but... It, I think that that caught a lot of people off guard on how many people will actually qualify for that because there are not very many businesses right now not suffering economic right injury, right? There, there just aren't. Um, so it's kind of one of those things. I, I probably agree with Shy on that. I think they're going to have to go back and probably reallocate funds there. Um, you know, I called two banks today that still don't have really any process set up for this. And I, you know, we heard that on Friday, you're supposed to be ready to start moving <laughs> up here. And, you know, we're two days out and people are like, well, how do I get this? Yeah. And banks still don't know. So there's some banks that were SBA approved that are a little bit further down the road on it. But this is supposed to be pretty broad. So that's the one I think, uh, you know, really just to keep jobs in place is going to be kind of over the next two weeks, really the big one that, you know. It's pretty amazing, me. isn't it, Jamie, how they just kind of took like, hey, here's the single biggest stimulus in small business history. Uh, <laughs> go for it. Just here. Just take a shot. See what you yeah, come up page with. Page two. Like, we don't really need a lot of information. <laughs> yeah, from that I know. Just so here's money. Like these seven <laughs> boxes, we'll give you a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. Jeff, what, what? specifically around the, the SBA piece, um, what is excluded that you should have, you think should be included um, when it comes to those, those SBA loans, or maybe just from the broader um, picture for businesses in particular, what do you think they should have put into the bill that didn't show up? Well, I think the first thing that kind of we already hit on is like they should have given us a little bit more definition in the rules. There's so much that is ambiguous here. Um, and, and the fact that we've now had both the law come out as well as the first round of, if you want to call it IRS or Treasury guidance on 
how these will work, and there are still so many questions, just goes to the heart of the problem, which is this was a law that was hastily drafted, uh, necessarily so, but a law that was hastily drafted that was pushed out very quickly, for which a lot of the provisions uh, are ill-conceived or are not very well fleshed out. And so they leave a lot up to either the Secretary of the Treasury or the, uh, the Secretary of Education. There's a lot of, okay, here's the basic guidelines for this, go fill in the blanks. But that's, a, you know, that's difficult for us as planners to work with because you know, we still don't know. Um, and in terms of like what's not included, to me, what's actually, while that's a, a great question, to me, the, the reverse is almost more interesting as to what's included in it. So it's now really clear that you know, net earnings from self-employment, for instance, are included in this, which is amazing that the government might actually pay you for your own losses as a business owner, uh, when really that's, you know, that's, part of the, uh, that's, that's part of the general risk of being a business owner is that you, you bear the burden of your business not failing. Now, obviously, these are you know unprecedented times, and so perhaps that was um, necessarily included. But it's pretty interesting for the government to say, "All right, we'll pay you two and a half months of your own net earnings from self-employment, and then potentially you can still go on and get unemployment after that." So uh, I think that's fairly interesting. Shai, what about at the policy center? What are you guys talking about? Pieces you wish would have been included, or something that would have really helped cash flow uh, for businesses that you expected to be there and didn't find? So I think Jeff hit on a bunch of the important points. And the theme is really that the government was trying to get as much money out to as many people as possible as quickly as possible. And when you're trying to do that on an unprecedented basis, you're inevitably going to set up programs that are amorphous, ambiguous, and that need a lot of definition. And ultimately, I think when we look back a year or two from now, probably going to have a lot of waste and abuse and fraud involved. There's really no way around that when you're pushing out $2 trillion. But I'm not sure there was really another way to do it, because I think the economic abyss that we are headed into right now is really unprecedented. I mean, I think there are people who are forecasting that this could end up being worse than the Great Recession. Obviously, it'll, a lot will depend on how the public health crisis evolves, how the economic situation evolves. But when the fears are that great, there's a lot greater risk in not doing enough than in doing too much. I mean, if somebody takes advantage of it and collects $20,000 from their self-employment income that they shouldn't have gotten, we'll, we'll you know, all collectively deal with it as a society, but it's not going to cause you know, massive economic suffering on a, on a national scale. So those, I think, were the, that was the balancing act that policymakers were thinking about when they drafted this. There are a few pieces that weren't included that I think they'll, they're going to need to come back to in addition to the small business element specifically around state support. State budgets are gonna be really suffering in the near term and making sure that states who have balanced budget requirements in many instances have that cash flow to get through this is gonna be critical. And then also another element of this that wasn't really addressed was the SNAP program, the food stamp program, where I think a lot of families, a remarkable amount of families are actually on food stamps and get significant support through that. And that's another way that it's easy to get direct payments to individuals. And I suspect that they may come back to that if they have another round. Do you expect to see additional legislation then that address those? I do. I think they're already talking about a phase four. I'm sure that there's going to be folks who are in the, no, we've already had three phases and that's enough camp and we've spent trillions of dollars. But my expectation is that as the data continue to evolve, both on the public health side and even more importantly for this specific discussion, on the economic side, that it's gonna become more and more apparent that what they've done so far is not gonna be sufficient to help us come out the other side of this. Jamie, are you feeling hopeful about this, this current process that we have? I know you were on the phone talking to banks, so do you yeah. think people are going to feel like this is a, a good win for them as they walk through this uncertain time? I mean, I, I think the one thing is, this is a pretty impressive spending bill that got done really quick from that side, right? And part of it is just getting the cash out there into the world too. So like, even if somebody abuses it and takes the money, if they kind of go back and spend it though, like it kind of gets to some of the same outcomes. I mean, obviously some people will benefit more than others, but you know, you really can't fault this bill for not being taking a big step on the economic side of things. Um, from my side, the things that I'm still worried about, like, you know, we're pretty close to New York and we keep hearing about, right, the ventilators and that we have 50 states bidding against each other right now. I think some centralized purchasing could have been done in this bill pretty quickly too for certain things. And like that, you know, some of the healthcare aspect of stuff has kind of been left off the table. So that's to me almost like phase four, which maybe should have been phase one, but 
but um, you know, that's kind of where we are on that side. I'm not saying it's, you know, was terrible, but you know, health insurance, we're kind of relying on the current system there, right? They expanded out some small coverage pieces, but when we talk about, we see numbers, maybe 30% unemployed coming up. Well, that's a lot of people that are either going to tax the Affordable Care Act system, which we've been, you know, from a government perspective, almost trying to kill for five years. And then all of a sudden being like, wow, it's really good. We have this system here to deal with all these people that might not have health insurance from their employer or something to, to subsidize COBRA. I thought that might have been something we, we could have seen, too. Um, because, you know, for a lot of people, this is like the worst time, right? Economic time's not good to lose your health insurance, but like right now it's like you clearly cannot lose your health insurance, right? Like if you're losing your job, like everything else, like I would pay my health insurance for my mortgage now because I think I'm going to be able to get some leeway on that side. But if I'm dropping off a health insurance, I look like in a really bad spot. So I think that's a big challenge moving forward. Maybe we'll see something there, but I think the whole health piece is the next piece that I want to see you know, just the government kind of coordinate and maybe on the insurance side provide something. Shai, do you think this provides enough stabilization to get us over the next two weeks? Yeah, I do think that this is going to buy us some time. Um, I mean, first of all, they're talking about the earliest this money actually going out the door is probably a few weeks from now. So we're really looking at the next few weeks being probably the most difficult period for a lot of households. Moreover, the $1,200 on an individual basis is only going to get you so far. Um, so I think it's helpful that a lot of the payments that people owe have been frozen. That was a really critical part of this bill, too, in terms of student loans and um, some things on housing as well. But I think very quickly, if the um, sort of shutdown goes on for as long as we are now hearing it could, or that people are sort of surmising and that we're talking about months, not weeks, that we're going to need to come back and figure out what are the additional supports that the economy needs. Jeff, do you have any um, little hidden gems that you really love in this bill that you think, oh, we can use this to get some plans in the right spot that maybe, you know, need a little tweaking after the, the market volatility? Well, I mean, I think it's a, a, a a compilation of everything that's going on right now. Markets being down, um, income is for people being down. So for instance, markets being down, income being down, you might look at this as an opportunity to you know, do like a Roth conversion or something like that. But I think the bigger picture is when you look at the law, you know, what are the unintended consequences that come? Because whenever you draft legislation, there's going to be loopholes or ways to kind of manipulate the law. You know, people like Shai and Jamie and myself, we're going to spend hours dissecting these bills to figure out, okay, how do I get the most out of this for, for individuals out there? And that's the case when a normal piece of legislation is drafted, not a two to six, depending upon how you want to call it, trillion dollar bill that gets shoved through in the matter of about a week. So there are all sorts of unintended loopholes. I mean, just thinking about it, you know, someone who had high income in 2018, who's now thinking about filing their return, um, and, you know, do they now file their return if they had lower income in 2019 just to get the, the check? Or maybe they had low income in 18, and they had higher income in 19. Do they kind of sit by and kind of twiddle their thumbs and not file their return purposely because there's no clawback. You know, the, the, the way they wrote this bill is so wild that there are so many unintended consequences. And that's just one of them um, in one section of this bill. But there's all others. I and mean, I think people are going to, in some cases, look to abuse the system, as people always do, and try to take advantage of things that, um, that, that were not intended by the law. For instance, another one would be, I've seen a lot of people talking about doing Roth conversions over three years and spreading the income out over three years using the coronavirus-related distribution provision if they qualify. Um, and I've been very outspoken, I know Jamie has as well, on saying that we don't believe that that is what the bill uh, intended and what that provision is for. And people should be very careful about doing that. Um, especially today when you can't recharacterize conversions, if all of a sudden the IRS comes out with guidance and says, you know, um, we're going to treat that as if the money was first put back into a traditional IRA and then rolled over, which they could do. They did a similar thing with NUA years ago where people were trying to manipulate the system. And they said, if you put NUA into a Roth IRA, we'll treat it first as if it went to a traditional IRA and then went to the Roth. So just whenever you draft a piece of legislation, there are these kind of loopholes. Or, or at least aspects of the bill that people will try to exploit. And I think that the way the bill was pushed through, again, rushed through, not, on, you know, not without reason, but still rushed through nonetheless, 
meant that you know 800 pieces of legislation were drafted in a matter of a week or so. And there are going to be more of those areas in this bill than there are in the typical bill of a similar size. I'll just add that I totally agree with Jeff on the retirement side, and I'm not nearly as steeped in the financial planning world as either Jeff or Jamie, but I am on record before they pass this as having said that the $100,000 provision of uh, exception of taking out money from these accounts uh, unpenalized and tax deferred or, or tax sort of spread out over three years was more likely to result in financial planning strategies than really as a lifeline for sort of lower moderate income households that were struggling to get through the crisis. So. Yeah, if your income is that low, then you, you want to have it included in that year. Like, tax me now when I have no income, please. Right. And you, know, and you probably is, don't have money, $100,000 in a 401k. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. Yeah. And you're probably not going to pay it back in three years either. <laughs> like, <laughs> exactly. It, like, as soon as you see that, you're like, man, like, this is a wealthier individual piece. I mean, to be honest, I, I know the RMD one kind of sounds nice, but even when you look at the IRS data on that one, right, it's only about 20% of people. Mm -hmm don't take out more than their RMD every year. We're really going to the people who are the highest net worth, not, in, not inclusively, but generally speaking, that's benefiting higher net worth retirees whose paychecks are fairly stable and didn't need the money. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, that's mostly who that's benefiting, right? Not exclusively, but mostly. Yeah, it, it is a terribly first world problem while everybody else is struggling around you trying to figure out how to pay their mortgage, how to eat, how to do all these things for a basic living. And you're sitting there like, how do I get the money I don't need back into my account? Like that is a very first world problem right now to be dealing with. <laughs> well, I appreciate all of you taking some time out of your day. And I know that's a first world pr problem too for us to squeeze all of these in. Thanks so much for being willing to come and chat and talk this all through. Any final thoughts that you want to leave everybody with? Jamie? Uh, yeah, so I guess I'll, I'll start. I'll just uh, thank Shai and Jeff and you too, Kim, for taking the time with us. And, you know, I think the big thing is, look, like we're in a, just a new phase that we've never been in before. And while we have some critiques of the bill and some things won't go smoothly and we will have some abuse out there, uh, the government did need to act. It needed to act quickly, right? We're, we're moving to this point where we might see 30% unemployment. We've never seen that before. So we need solves there. We need solves quickly. If we waited another two months, right, it, you kind of can't quite imagine that people would even stay home anymore, right? So we had to get the cash out there. Um, but, you know, there's going to be a lot of questions. Like, there's a lot of this stuff. I mean, we're not going to, as Jess said, we might be finding out answers next year about this. I mean, we were still waiting for tax cut and job answers from two and a half years ago. And so we're going to be waiting on a lot of these things to get... And now they're undoing some of those provisions. <laughs> yeah, and now we just said they never existed. Just pretend like that didn't happen. <laughs> So we get some of that in there too. And yeah, so, but I think, you know, this was a big step. It's moving fast. There is a lot of relief here. It's not the last thing we'll see, but I think overall there's a lot of positives and there will be some abuse, but I think that's almost something we have to live with to some degree um, to get something like this done in a week. Shai, any final thoughts from you? I'll just very quickly sort of put on my bipartisan policy center hat and say that I think it is pretty remarkable when we talk about how our government is dysfunctional and not working the way it should, that in a matter of, as Jeff said, about a week or 10 days, two weeks, however you want to look at it, they threw together a $2.2 trillion bill to try to rescue the economy from the fallout from this crisis. It's not the best, you know, things, in, it's not the best bill that's ever been crafted, but I think in, in the time that they did, it's pretty impressive how expansive it was and how they got unanimous agreement in the Senate, basically, on it and, and effectively in the House as well. So, it just shows, I think, that the gears of democracy can function when ultimately necessary. Whether we can get back to that on a regular basis is a real question, but at least we were able to do it in this time of crisis. We'll celebrate the small win. Jeff, what about you? Final thought? You know, I guess I'd probably just bring it back on a, on a personal level here and away from finances and so forth. You know, uh, I live in New York, uh, not in the city, but um, close by. My wife is a healthcare professional that goes in to work at the hospital. You know, we're, we're kind of in the middle of ground zero here in, in many ways. And I would simply say that for those who haven't seen this materialize in their area yet, um, hopefully, you know, I'd like to say it's coming. Or I would like not to say it's coming, but it probably is. Um, and I would just say, take this seriously. The, a lot of the stories that you hear that you think are just unbelievable, you know, even as, as, as hard to fathom as, you know, putting bodies into, you know, freezer trucks at hospitals. I mean, these stories are true. Um, I've had clients already who have come down 
uh, with this illness have been hospitalized from it. Like this is a, a real thing. It is highly contagious. You know, I'm not a healthcare expert, um, but I can see what's going on around me. And I see the impact that it has on our clients as well as healthcare professionals like my wife, not only the, the physical toll, but the emotional toll of, of the struggle. So uh, I would just thank everybody for whoever's out there who's following these procedures and, you know, keeping your social distance and, you know, giving everyone space. I know it's difficult and we all want to go back to normal life. I, I wish we were doing this in a real panel and shaking each other's hands after this, but it's okay. Like we'll get through this together. Uh, we just need to follow the guidelines that have been put in place to take these matters seriously so that this recovery happens as quick as possible. As slow as that may be, let's, let's still make it as quick as possible and have as few people impacted by this health-wise as we possibly can. Um, and just best wishes for everybody's health, you know, for, for good health throughout the rest of the year and, and, and onwards. Well, and please thank your wife for, on, on all of our behalf. Thank you. It's her and the other professionals who are... Indeed, there are so many of them out there. It's just amazing the work they're doing. Um, I'm in awe every day, every day. Thank you guys all so much. Stay healthy. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye.